Uh, and I, unfortunately, I, it would have been really nice if I had the chance, if we all had a chance to be together, it would have been fun uh, to see old friends uh, again. So I thought I would begin my talk by explaining how a dermatology research problem led to my interest in human research ethics and what I learned about informed consent. Um, as Cheeto mentioned, uh, I was very interested in the role of fibronectin in wound healing. And I was fortunate uh, to have as colleagues, Paul Bergstresser, who was chair of dermatology, and Charlie Baxter, who was director of bird research at UT Southwestern. And uh, Paul and Charlie uh, taught me a lot about clinical aspects of wound repair, uh, and including uh, uh, things about wounds that didn't heal, uh, like venous stasis ulcers. Uh, at that time, uh, some of the research in our, my laboratory showed that fibronectin promoted the migration of human keratinocytes, and that was work done by a postdoctoral fellow, Akira Takashima, uh, who continued in dermatology uh, in the United States and now is chair of medical microbiology and immunology at the University of Toledo. Um, we uh, uh, thought that maybe if we use fibronectin to topically treat uh, venous stasis ulcers, it would help them close. And I happen to know that the New York Blood Center had a large amount of uh, fibronectin that was purified and went through phase one trials for a study that was never actually carried out and was available for partnering. So we started out in collaboration with them to study uh, whether or not treatment of venous stasis ulcers uh, with fibronectin would promote uh, closure. And those studies uh, were carried out uh, by uh, Annette Wasaki, who was a postdoc with Charlie Baxter at the time and later uh, with me. And Annette, of course, has gone on uh, at this point to become Dean of the School of Nursing at Stony Brook. Well, um, we enrolled a 69-year-old African-American woman who had bilateral uh, ulcers. And uh, uh, Charlie says, well, why don't we randomize her ulcers instead of her? And uh, that turned out to be um, uh, had consequences. It was actually not a great idea. These days, one could never do that, but then uh, uh, research, herbicide of human research was much less uh, stringent. And I simply wrote a letter to the uh, head of the IRB saying, is it okay to do that? And he said, sure, why not? So we did. And uh, uh, it had two consequences when this lady says at the end of uh, three weeks, uh, what do you mean uh, this is uh, finished? Whatever you've been doing uh, to my left leg, I want you to continue. And what you've been doing to my right leg, I want you to stop and start doing to what you've been doing to my left because I feel better than I have for the last five years. So what do you do when a research subject doesn't realize that research is not equal therapy? So one consequence of that uh, request was that the New York Blood Center agreed to provide additional fibronectin and we treated her for six months or so, um, and eventually the left, uh, the ulcer in the left leg closed completely, and the right uh, mostly closed. And then she stopped uh, coming uh, to the uh, clinic. Uh, and as it, it turns out, that she was the best ever uh, responder to fibronectin, uh, much better than any other other patient. The other consequence, though, was that I got interested in this question uh, about uh, research and therapy. Now, you have to keep in mind, this is 1986. Uh, the formalized rules for human research in the United States only uh, were in place beginning in 1979 uh, so with the Belmont Report. So this was pretty early in, in formalization of human research ethics, and, and people were just beginning to do research. And uh, uh, some of the things that had been uh, studied and already discovered uh, included what was called the therapeutic misconception, which I'm sure uh, most of you have heard of. And, and really what happens is that in taken for granted everyday life experience, therapy means being treated by medical professionals for a medical condition. And that's the same thing that happens in the initial research setting. And so what if you say to the person, well, this is research, it might not work, uh, uh, or you might not get the, the, real, the real thing. The, the thing is that these folks are there because nothing has worked so far. So, so the question I wanted to ask is, well, how does the subject learn in practical terms the difference between therapy and research? And what became quickly uh, obvious to me was that in therapy, treatment continues as long as the patient gets better. 
but in research, treatment stops at the end of the experiment, even if the subject's health has been improving, and even if the condition might deteriorate as a consequence. And I wrote my first uh, uh, essay about uh, human research and, and informed consent, endings of clinical research protocols distinguishing therapy from research. So I had a chance to uh, become involved about 10 years later with thinking about informed consent in relationship to genomics. Uh, the the uh, Reynolds Foundation funded the Dallas Heart Study, and I was part of the group that figured out, well, what do you have to tell uh, potential subjects? And the issues that we were concerned with uh, at the time uh, have become the same issues that everybody has been concerned with since then. This was actually one of the first uh, uh, genome-wide uh, screens in the United States. Uh, and of course, the issues are the risks and benefits to the subject, uh, access to the data, and uh, discovery, uh, and later reporting of incidental findings. And uh, in short, uh, it, when it comes to genomics and human research, the risks and benefits are uncertain, privacy is uncertain, and genomics experiments uh, don't have necessarily clear endings. So uh, I have continued uh, trying to think about how uh, challenges to taken for granted everyday life experience influence uh, biomedical ethics and its evolution, and tried to capture some of my current thinking in this paper that was just published in Nature Review's Molecular Cell Biology, the title of which is the same as my talk today. Biomedical Ethics 2.0, Redefining the Meaning of Disease, Patient, and Treatment. Um, Bioethics 1.0 emerged because of new ways of understanding what it means to be human. And by that, I mean that we uh, uh, now have human bodies on external life support. We have human embryos in vitro outside of mom's reproductive tract. And we use human patients as subject and subjects and all of these innovations uh, were part of uh, the 20th century developments in technology and, and medical practice. And, and before that, we could think about these maybe in a, in a theoretical sense, but we didn't have to make practical decisions uh, based on, on these ways of interacting. So Bioethics 2.0 comes about uh, for similar kinds of reasons, but now, uh, the issue is uh, understanding the language of medicine. And I think that in genomics, uh, words like disease, patient, and treatment have taken on new meanings, uh, and that's what I want to discuss now. So first, the meaning of disease. Well, conventionally, disease uh, meant that uh, you felt diseased. That's how, how a person feels. And you felt that, you knew it, and you went and saw whoever counted as your health care provider. And over time, um, um, medical discoveries led to uh, ability to identify specific uh, sets of atypical physiology or anatomy as part of uh, disease and named diseases. And once you have that, those relationships, uh, now you can uh, have a, be, be subject to having a disease without really feeling diseased. And uh, here, Imagine going to your healthcare provider for your routine checkup. You're feeling just fine, and then you discover that your blood pressure is too high, and your cholesterol is too high, and your bone density is too low, and you leave not feeling nearly as well as when you arrived. So originally, you felt it first, and then in the second phase, uh, your uh, physician uh, uh, recognizes the disease first, and now we have the third phase uh, of genetic risk. And now disease doesn't mean having anything. It ha means having a risk. And, and you can predict this risk based upon uh, a typical genome with such and such sequences uh, as being characteristic of this risk. And you can do that uh, even in the development of the individual before there is a human body plan. Uh, and, and because of the current ongoing genomics revolution, anybody can now find out about their genomes. We can all learn about our set of original diseases, the diseases for which we are at risk. Uh, and if we want to, we can uh, 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 go out and get the technology, like uh, the set of apps offered by Helix, uh, genome-informed apps to manage our lives. Uh, should I consult a dietitian? What about my health? What about nutrition? 
put in your genome and your app will tell you what to do. In short, uh, genomics has pervasively medicalized the human condition and now we don't even know what the answer is to the question, when does disease really begin? Okay. So, and then there's the change in the meaning of patient bodies. So in modern medicine, we uh, have medical specialization, psychiatrists, cardiologists, podiatrists, orthopedists, that taken together gives us a fragmented body. Nobody has the big picture. Um, we have transplantation medicine that gives us mosaic bodies with parts of other people. And we have external life support giving us brain impaired bodies that are still there. Um, but all of these things have in common one patient, one body. When we go to genomic medicine, that changes. It's still uh, one patient, one body, but also we can think about one patient as having many bodies, or we can think about one patient as being one embryo. The embryo is the best genetic patient, and that's because disease risk predates a body plan. So think about the embryo as mostly genetics, that's the white, with a little bit of history, that's the blue. And over time, the adult becomes mostly blue, the history, and just a little bit of white genetics uh, that remain that could be uh, influenced. So genetic options decrease as the embryo body becomes the historical person. And, uh, and embryos now have been involved in uh, so many different kinds of uh, research. The embryo patient is involved in IVF, in genetic testing, in uh, uh, preparing embryonic stem cells, in mitochondrial replacement, a relatively new technology that involves the ovum, uh, and, uh, and the future uh, gene editing, which we have been debating a lot in, in the last couple of years uh, since CRISPR-Cas. But the thing about the embryo patient is that it's a controversial patient. Uh, that is that uh, uh, it's very divisive, uh, research on embryos is very divisive because society disagrees on two key questions. One is when does an embryonic clump of human cells become a person? And two, in any case, what moral status does this clump of human cells deserve? And those folks uh, who uh, oppose uh, any kind of research with embryos uh, either view the embryo as a person or at least as having the moral status uh, of a person. And then we have one patient, many bodies, and it's obvious that uh, uh, in this pedigree that uh, everybody's interrelated. Genomic information for individuals uh, have implications for other family members and larger groups. And this results in creation of two uh, categories of individuals. First, the secondary patients, when one family member has been tested for a disease. And the question is, what responsibilities do healthcare providers to inform other family members about genetic risk? And the other is the family members as secondary research subjects. If, you, uh, uh, if this twin here, who's marked with an asterisk, wants to have research done on her, uh, what is the responsibility of the investigators to ask her twin? Uh, it, permission, because obviously they know one, about one, they're going to learn everything about the other. Uh, and neither of these uh, uh, sets of questions is well answered, although the latter is kind of interesting in the day of uh, uh, Henrietta Lacks' uh, 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 in interest, uh, because of this book, uh, uh, the, uh, when, the, when the, uh, the genomic information about HeLa cells was about to be published. Um, the family, who was now well aware of things going on uh, in science and in biomedical research, said, hey, wait a second, that we're secondary subjects. You can't, you can't publish that the genome because uh, it invades our privacy. And in the end, uh, there was a deal between NIH and the family creating an oversight committee that would decide who could have access to the genomic information about HeLa cells and how they could use it. So that's a whole new way of thinking uh, that may uh, uh, become more prevalent in the future, but uh, it's hard to predict. And then finally, we have the meaning of treatment, uh, uh, which varies according to the disease and the patient. So, so one approach, of course, is treating genetic disorders by correcting or preventing disease symptoms. 
um, and we think multifactorial illnesses uh, where genomics is the basis for precision medicine. It helps us diagnose uh, diseases and help select treatment options. And uh, those treatment options increasingly include the possibility of therapy with genes, not of genes, but with genes. Uh, and then we have single gene inherited disorders. And there, conventionally, uh, newborn screening uh, since the 1960s, have, uh, of beginning with the 1960s, allowed identification uh, through metabolic testing of uh, phenylketonuria and intervention through a special diet to prevent symptoms from developing. And even where there is no curative therapy, uh, this information can help with lifestyle management. And here again is the possibility of, of some genetic interventions, gene tra transfer replacement therapy, to correct uh, some diseases as long as disease-associated genetic differences uh, are not uh, uh, expressed throughout the body in a way that causes uh, the disease. Now, of course, this, the, these therapeutic options, one of the questions that's uh, unresolved is uh, uh, whether or not society can afford them. Uh, just as an example, CAR-T cell therapy for leukemia and lymphoma is $475,000. Zolgensma gene therapy transfer for spinal muscular atrophy is $2.1 million. So these are uh, hefty price, price tags for, for the therapeutic interventions. Okay, so this is correcting or preventing disease symptoms. Uh, the alternative is preventing the birth of at-risk individuals. And uh, conventionally, this was done by screening, uh, genetic, genetic screening of adults or metabolic screening, which made it possible to identify carriers of dis genetic disorders and inform family planning. So you could avoid the marriage or don't have children. And the, the first um, major genetic disorder uh, that was uh, treated this way was Tay-Sachs disease when, when a metabolic screening uh, in the 1970s helped uh, eliminate this disease mostly from the Ashkenazi Jewish community. But more and more we have the alternative of embryos and fetuses discarding embryos or terminating pregnancies. Genomic sequencing can show which in vitro embryos are at high risk for genetic disorders, uh, non-invasive prenatal testing, and IPT can show fetal genetic signatures that are associated with trisomies, such as Down syndrome. Uh, and these two technologies have become highly developed. And then finally, of course, we have the possibility of gene editing to correct embryo genetic disorders uh, or to achieve improvements. But uh, that may be possible sometime in the future, but it will be the distant future. So for the moment, there's more and more emphasis on these two kinds of interventions to prevent uh, genetic disorders by preventing the, to treat genetic order, or disorders by preventing the birth of at-risk individuals. And that uh, uh, is uh, in direct ethical conflict with multiple segments of society, those, the, that kind of treatment with the disability community, with those opposed to destroying embryos, and those opposed to terminating pregnancies. And, uh, and, and moves the focus of genomic medicine into the domain of eugenics. And that, that uh, move is exactly what was predicted when the Office of Technology Assessment uh, evaluated the Human Genome Project in 1988 and said new technologies for identifying traits and altering genes makes it possible for eugenic goals to be achieved through self-selecting, meaning through the parents making decisions, technologies as opposed to government-imposed social control, uh, as was characteristic of eugenics uh, in the uh, early to mid-20th uh, century. So in thinking about genetics, uh, this film, Gattaca, from 1997, uh, shows us uh, two ways, uh, two different paths. Um, uh, it, the film is about uh, a, a boy named Vincent uh, who wants to become a space pilot. Uh, he was conceived na uh, primitively uh, through uh, uh, sexual relations, uh, not IVF, which had become the natural way in society. And he has a 99% chance of developing heart disease. And so uh, that's, the, that's the dynamic in the film. 
Uh, and there are two scenes that are worth thinking about. One is in the genetic counseling office. And this is when the geneticist is working with the parents uh, regarding Vincent's younger sibling to be. And he says, after screening, these are embryos, we're left with two healthy boys and two healthy girls. No critical, critical predispositions. All that remains is to select the most compatible candidate. And, and so this really helps the, pay, the parents make a decision. Do they want a boy? Do they want a girl? Uh, et cetera. And they want a boy. They want Vincent to have a younger brother. So that's one uh, way of using the information. Uh, another it comes out in the personnel office when Vincent is looking for a job. And he says, my father was right. It didn't matter how much I lied on my resume. My real CV was in my cells. Uh, meaning his DNA. And here we have social philosophy that uh, if you have the wrong uh, genetic composition, uh, then you can't have the job. The, your genetics determines what you can do and what you can be. So these are conventional ways of thinking of eugenics. Um, but interestingly, uh, this paper uh, uh, offered an alternative perspective uh, that I thought uh, was uh, actually uh, pretty enlightened, and, uh, and I think it's worth quoting uh, the conclusion at the end of the paper, uh, the paper Genetic Analysis of Social Class Mobility in Five Longitudinal Studies, and the authors conclude a long-term goal of our sociogenomic research is to use genetics to reveal novel environmental intervention approaches to mitigating socioeconomic disadvantage. Ultimately, this research can suggest interventions that change children's environments to promote positive development across the life course. So we have two alternative trajectories of eugenics as for social philosophy then. One is determining what one can accomplish, but the other is determining how to enhance what one can accomplish. And uh, I would say that choosing between these trajectories will be the key challenge or become a key challenge for Biomedical Ethics 2.0. So let me just sum up what I've told you, the key issues for Biomedical Ethics 2.0. Uh, first, genomic medicine changes the meaning of disease and pervasively medicalizes the human situation. Uh, when does disease really begin? The embryo is the best genetic patient despite the embryo's controversial moral status. The many bodies patient leads to issues of secondary patients and secondary subjects. And finally, treatment of genetic disorders by preventing at-risk individuals inevitably links genomic medicine to eugenics. So that's the end of my comments. Um, uh, thank you everyone for your attention. And in this strange time, uh, uh, everyone, I hope, stays safe. <laughs>